Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, the latest scheme to fix climate change, to basically stop the weather from being the weather. Yes, rationing. This whole idea is being floated by a group of scientists out of Leeds University in a new paper. It was covered by the Times, and uh, I'm just going to like take you through it, basically. How to fix global warming. Bring back rationing. Oh, this just sounds delightful, doesn't it? Second World War style rationing of petrol, household energy and meat could help fight climate change, British scientists have recommended. Could help fight climate change. Always the, the weasel word in there. You know, I mean, jumping up and down a hundred million times could help flatten the earth. That doesn't mean it actually will. Researchers from Leeds have said that rationing would help countries to cut their carbon emissions fairly and rapidly, even though it was often seen as an unpalatable option. Ah, yes. Don't worry. Don't worry. They've figured it out how to make it more palatable. <laughs> of course. Making a comparison with the need to limit the consumption of certain goods as they grew scarce during the war, researchers noted that the idea of achieving this by increasing taxes was rejected in the 1940s because, quote, the impact of tax rises would be slow and inequitable. And also because the rich would just pay their way around them and these taxes were highly regressive and hit the poor the worst. Their study, published in the journal Ethics, Policy and Environment, noted rationing has been neglected as a climate change mitigation policy option. Well, not really, actually. Um, there's been a lot of people talking about it, although these uh, sort of concepts have mainly been around the idea of personal carbon allowances, cap and trade thing, where basically you get a carbon ration from the government. You can, uh, you know, sell that off at the end of the month if you haven't used all your carbon. And if you're rich enough, you can buy extra carbon credits and so keep your highly carbonated lifestyle going if that's what you want. Of course, there are other schemes that are designed where you cannot trade your personal carbon allowance to stop rich people getting around it. These are seen as advantageous because they encourage monetary redistribution by having the rich buy extra unused carbon credits off the poor at the end of the month. They get some extra money. Fuck knows what they're going to do with it, though, if, uh, you know, I, I guess they can spend it on stuff that doesn't involve emitting any carbon. Perhaps a tasty bug burger or a new poster for your pod. I mean, you know, the possibilities are endless. Maybe a new NFT for your Twitter profile. <laughs> to show the world how good you are by uh, limiting your carbon output. Oh, I can hardly wait. Can you imagine how good you're going to feel, dear citizen, being able to display your virtue to everybody else on Twitter about how much carbon you have saved to fix the weather? Ah, oh, oh, it's going to be glorious. It added that rationing was widely accepted in Britain during the conflict, this is the Second World War, explaining as long as there was scarcity, rationing was accepted, even welcomed and demanded. Now, I actually, like, you know, read the read most of this paper. Okay, I read about half of it. it it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty heavy going. And uh, basically what they're saying in it is that uh, what people disliked more than the rationing was the unfairness. So as goods got scarcer and the rich had more of them and there was more speculation and queues and lines formed and it became increasingly difficult to get basic staples, it was more the unfairness that some people had eggs and meat whilst others did not, that really grated on people rather than the shortages themselves. And this was one of the political levers that was used to introduce rationing during the war. And I should note that rationing actually continued nine years after the end of the war. In fact, I believe it was Ramsay MacDonald, the Labour Prime Minister, who was actually voted in on the prospect of continuing the war system as it currently was. It's that old sort of communist thing. The poor at least got a ration, although it should be noted that during the war, um, stuff wasn't free, right? You had to pay money, but you had to have a ration book in order to buy something. So just because you had enough money to buy eggs, it didn't matter. If you didn't have a ration card, they wouldn't sell them to you. At least uh, they would on the black market. There was a lot of that going on under the table, is my understanding. Rationing did not end in Britain until 1954, nine years after the end of the war. 
The researchers said rationing was often seen as unattractive and therefore not a viable option for policymakers. It is important to highlight the fact that this was not the case for many of those who had experienced rationing. Oh, they loved it. It is important to emphasize the difference between rationing itself and the scarcity that rationing was in response to. Of course, people did welcome the end of rationing, but they were really celebrating the end of scarcity and celebrating the fact that rationing was no longer necessary. Well, of course, if we are to believe the climate change people, there will never, ever be a time when resources are not scarce because, after all, they're not doing nuclear power. They're doing solar and wind and the resources to build those things are limited, so it will be a permanent scarcity or sustainability as they like to call it. The paper notes, however, that people, quote, may not accept rationing when there is an abundance of resources available. Oh no! What do? How to convince people to ration stuff when they look around and they're like, hey, there's enough stuff, what are you doing? Well, don't worry, dear viewer, they have a solution. The researchers argue that as a first step, governments would need to regulate sectors such as the oil industry with the importing of fossil fuels banned or restricted in certain areas. This would create a scarcity of fossil fuels with rationing then introduced to manage the scarcity. So basically, they create the shortage in the first place and then have to bring in rationing in order to deal with the shortage that they created, which just incidentally also gives them tremendous power over the economy and the ability to track and trace literally every every single transaction in the entire economy. But, you know, they, they don't want that, obviously, right? You know, they it's not like they want all that extra power. It's just, you know, from the paper itself, given that these policies would result in scarcity, uh, this is the bankrupting of the fossil fuel industry deliberately, uh, this might be hard to sell. But given the increasing recognition of the problem, climate change, and the clear link between fossil fuels and climate change, the message would be simpler, and from that point of view, the message to the public might be easier to sell. To avoid inflicting serious harms on future generations, and on many who are alive today, we must drastically reduce the amount of fossil fuels we burn. Given the consensus among climate scientists, oh yes, the consensus, this is a conclusion it is hard to argue against. Rationing would then be the second stage of this approach. While regulation created the scarcity, rationing would manage the scarcity. And as we have argued, rationing has proved its effectiveness in managing scarcity. On this approach, rationing would be similar to World War II rationing, in that rationing would again be a direct response to a clear and immediate scarcity of resources. So there you go. On the other hand, there seems to be a bit of a pushback against the climate thing. Uh, you know, if only they could, oh, I don't know, have like a war or something, like another world war that would drastically limit resources and thus enable rationing. Ah, oh, well, there's no chance of that happening, is there, ladies and gentlemen? Mm -hmm. A release issued with the study notes, governments could ration specifically selected good, goods such as flights, petrol, household energy, or even meat and clothing. Oh, awesome. Awesome. You not only get to eat the bugs and live in the pods, but you get to wear, I don't know, goy rags as well. <laughs> Fucking God. The paper adds, governments could limit the number of long-haul flights an individual could make in a year, or they could limit the amount of petrol one can buy in a month. I just want to point this out, right? This is not, I mean, yes, this is just one paper, but there is like a growing body of literature around these concepts, right? Given that they have basically said climate change is a thing, we have to destroy the fossil fuel industry, we know this is going to piss the people off, we know it's going to result in scarcity, what is the best way to massage and manage these expectations so that when we do this, the entirety of society doesn't combust? An alternative method would be through, quote, the modernization of rationing with carbon cards, like bank cards, to keep track of your carbon allowance rather than ration cards. Gee! That sounds like a conspiracy theory that I read a couple of years ago. Gosh, it's amazing how many of those keep coming true these days. I just I, I can't understand it. The researchers recommend that people should not be allowed to trade or sell their carbon allowance, arguing it is feasible that allowance-based schemes could exist with non-tradable allowances. Well, yes, of course, as I was saying before, if you're allowed to trade your extra carbon credits, then the rich could just get around it. Uh, of course, the rich will always get around this kind of like stuff. That is the way the world works. But, you know, it's seen as being less fair. I, I guess... I guess these people would basically prefer the black market because, you know, then they can bust people occasionally, but you're not going to get around this. 
<clears throat> Dr. Nathan Wood, joint lead author of the study, who is based at the Sustainability Research Institute at Leeds University and is now a postdoctoral fellow at Utrecht University's Fair Energy Consortium. Oh, mate, I bet he's great fun at parties. The concept of rationing could help not only in the mitigation of climate change, but also in reference to a variety of other social and political issues, such as the current energy crisis, which would not bloody exist if it weren't for all of this climate change bullshit in the first place, right? This is classic dialectical bullshit. You create the problem, and then you proffer the solution. The solution to the problem is the exact place that you wanted to get, get to before you invented the problem in the first place. Dr. Rob Lawlor, his fellow joint lead author and lecturer at the Interdisciplinary Ethics Applied Center at Leeds, I bet he's also fun at parties, said there is a limit to how much we can emit if we are to reduce the catastrophic impacts of climate change. In this sense, the scarcity is very real. So basically, you know, there's another part of the paper where they're pretty much arguing, although there is an actual scarcity of resources because of climate change and because, well, we have to reduce fossil fuels, that's really a kind of like scarcity after all. And so really, if you think about it, we basically need rationing now. Now, I just want to point this out. That the way policy uh, formation generally works, right, when new policies come about, is that a new government will come in and they'll have some kind of like base idea or ideology, right? And then they'll start casting around for policy ideas that will support the outcome or ideology they want. And think tanks and sort of academics basically exist in the policy research space in order to do this legwork so that when the government comes in, they can basically reach out and say, hey, you know, we want to do a thing. Has anyone got any policy position papers on how to do the thing? And then a think tank or academic group will say, hey, actually, as it turns out, we've been thinking along these lines for like ages. Here's a bunch of papers on how you can implement this policy. So <clears throat> what have we learned? This whole idea of rationing for the climate is really just lurking there in the wings until the next time a government gets in power that is willing to use such devices. And I highly suggest that when Labour gets in in the UK, they would be more than happy to embrace this kind of stuff. Of course, if the war really, really kicks off, that will make it a whole lot easier because then they'll be able to say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not us. We hate to do the rationing, but, you know, Putler's illegal war in Ukraine has forced us. Where's this going to go, bros? I don't know. The conspiracy theorists are like right 10 for 10 at this point. So uh, I guess the uh, only confirmation that we're going to need that this is in fact happening is when the government comes out and calls it a conspiracy theory. Am I right? <laughs> anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please uh, like, share, subscribe and all that kind of stuff. And we'll see you in a couple of days. Good night.